basic and important facts about immigration history, illegality, and DACA presented by the DACA seminar here at Harvard. My name is Genevieve Clutario. I'm an assistant professor in history and history and literature. I'm also a member on the, on the Committee of Ethnicity, Migration, and Rights. Um, before introducing our two amazing speakers today, I want to quickly take the opportunity to thank um, several folks. The Inequality Initiative of the Social Science Dean's Office, the Warren Center for Studies in American History, the Graduate School of Education, Ethnicity, Migration, and Rights Committee. So today we're very fortunate to have two speakers. May, Dr. May Nye is the Professor of History and Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies. Um, she is a legal and political historian of United States history, interested in questions of immigration, citizenship, and nationalism. She is the author of the award-winning book, Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens, and the Making of a Modern America, seriously the reason why I'm a historian today, um, and The Lucky Ones, <laughs> One Family, and, and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America. She is now working on The Chinese Question, a study of Chinese gold miners and racial politics in the 19th century California, the Australian co colony of Victoria, and the Sa South African Transvaal. Before becoming a historian, she was a labor union organizer and educator in New York City, working for District 65, UAW, and the Consortium for Worker Education. Nye has written on immigration history and policy for the Washington Post, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The Nation, and the Boston Review. And this, this, um, her writing also includes a piece she wrote shortly after November's election entitled, A Call for Sanctuary, published in Descent Magazine. Roberto Gonzalez is a professor of education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research centers on contemporary processes of immigration and social inequality and stems from theoretical interests at the intersections of race and ethnicity, immigration, and policy. In particular, his research examines the effects of legal context on the coming of age experience of vulnerable and hard to reach immigrant youth populations. Since 2002, he has carried out one of the most comprehensive studies of undocumented immigrants in the United States. His book, Lives in Limbo, Undocumented and Coming of Age in America, is based on an in-depth study of that followed 150 undocumented young adults in Los Angeles for 12 years. So today we have a chance to learn from and be in dialogue with these two amazing scholars who will discuss with us DACA and illuminate the long histories of racism, current ramifications of racist policies and policy undoing, and the imperative struggles that we need to take towards a better future. So please join me in welcoming and thanking our speakers. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, before we get started, I wanted to uh, say a couple words about the DACA seminar um, so that people can uh, stay tuned. I don't know what I just did. I zoomed, zoomed in or something. Oh, good for you. Um, but I, I also want to thank our, our very generous sponsorship from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the Inequality in America Initiative, the Harvard University Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Committee on Ethnicity, Migration, and Rights, um, the Charles Warren Center for, for Studies in American History, and to my colleagues, um, David Carrasco, Kirsten Weld, uh, Walter Johnson, Lorja Garcia-Pena, Mary Waters, uh, Genevieve Cutario, and uh, Jason Beckfield, uh, and a growing cast of characters. Um, so as many people know, on September 5th, um, U.S. Attorney Jeff General Jeff Sessions announced an end to the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, uh, an administrative action by the Obama administration uh, to protect young undocumented immigrants from deportation. Um, in the five years of the program, nearly 800,000 uh, young people have, be have benefited from work authorization and related access. Um, the termination of the program has reopened debates about the place of these young people um, and their families um, 
sorry, reopened a, about the place of these young people in American society, and it has sparked efforts on the part of lawmakers, uh, educators, institutional agents, and immigrant communities to advocate on the part of these young people and their families and to address a growing set of needs. So in the wake of that announcement, and as the Trump administration winds down the program, set to end on March 5th, many questions have surfaced. Um, is there a quick congressional fix uh, for this pop particular population? What is the future of US immigration policy? And how do and will communities respond? The DACA seminar at Harvard is an effort that we're engaged in in service to opening up a space of learning and dialogue uh, to our campus and the larger community around questions related to the termination of DACA, the current state of immigration policy and practice, and its implications for community, uh, and that being scholars, artists, families, policymakers, and practitioners. So through a series of events on campus set to run between late January um, and, and March of next year, it is our hope to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders in an effort to gain a better understanding of the issues at hand while engaging the merits of various viewpoints. Um, so stay tuned. We will, uh, we'll, 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 we will um, in, in, in short order, we'll have a, uh, a roster of events. Um, we are committed to really engaging a larger community. So to the extent to which we can, <coughs> as we are today, uh, we'll be live streaming events so that we open up um, possibilities for audience. And, um, and throughout this sem seminar, it's very important to us to be centering the voices of those most impacted. Uh, so please stay tuned. Hmm, I'm a Mac person. Just go down. I'll reload it. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Just close that one. Okay. Did you say? <laughs> so sorry. So so we close. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay. And then open that one. So you just want to make sure that uh, this one. Yeah. Uh -huh. so okay. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. It's a great turnout on a Friday evening. It's wonderful that you all came. You look like a lively bunch, so I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, thanks very much to all the units at Harvard. I can't remember them all who made this possible. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, I don't know if I'll set the record straight <laughs> as advertised, but I want to give a historical overview of immigration uh, as a way of framing uh, our thinking, so we might approach our, the current crisis and controversies that we face with some historical perspective. Um, and so I, I offer this historical interpretation as a kind of critical analysis and as a way of suggesting a different kind of approach to the issues in our own time. So um, I've kind of taken the idea of I'll talk about myths, theory, and history as a way of getting at those issues. So. Let's just get right to the first myth. Um, this photograph, right, this uh, Statue of Liberty, perhaps the single greatest symbol of America as a welcoming nation and a nation of immigrants. Now, if you look at this picture, it's really weird, right, because the Statue of Liberty is a drawing. Right? It's not actually a photograph. I mean, you, you're supposed to think this is a photograph of people cheering the statue as they arrive in America, but that's a drawing back there. And the people on the boat, um, I think, are actually leaving New York. Because <laughs> they're dressed, they're, they're dressed as American, not European. Uh, so it's about somewhere be before World War I. But it was very typical in America for you to tip your hat say hello or goodbye in the early 20th century. So I think they're, they may be arriving, but more likely they're leaving. 
Um, and even if they were arriving, they wouldn't have been f right. Uh, they wouldn't have arrived looking at the Statue of Liberty. So we don't know what they're cheering. We don't know who they are. But the most unlikely explanation of this image is that they were immigrants arriving and cheering the Statue of Liberty. So let's look at. So we'll get back to why this image is then created. Why I don't know who created it. I found it on the web. But we'll get back to why this image became important to present, right? The, the message that it does. So. Um, so one reason why immigrants would not have cheered the statue entering is because the statue actually faces New York. It doesn't face the Atlantic. So if you're arriving, you have to actually turn around to see the front of the Statue of Liberty. So that's another reason why it's unlikely that they were arriving and looking at the statue. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, and there's also highly unlikely that anybody arriving before World War I would have known Emma Lazarus's famous poem, uh, Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So what's the history of this statue? Well, um, in 1865, a French abolitionist, Edouard de Laboyer, uh, who is head of the French Anti-Slavery Society, um, wanted to have a statue in, in America. And he wanted a statue that would honor African American slaves and their freedom in the Civil War. And he collaborated with uh, Frederick Bartholdi, who is the one who actually, a sculptor known for colossal pieces. Um, and so they worked on this idea. And the initial sketches that Bartholdi made, uh, it's actually not this. This is interesting. This is what patented in the US Patent Office. But the first sketches showed later Lady Liberty holding not a lamp, but, a ch but chains, broken chains. And if you go there today, you can still see her feet, the broken chains and shackle around her feet. So that's some evidence that we still have in the statue of its original intention. Um, by the time we fi finally got around to getting the statue built in the early 1880s, uh, Americans weren't that interested in the Civil War or in s slave emancipation anymore, um, which is another story. But you American historians won't understand that. Um, so they rebranded the statue as a celebration of French-American friendship and uh, republicanism. Now, um, Congress voted to accept France's gift of this statue to the United States. But France paid only for the building of the statue itself, which is about $400,000, uh, and not the pedestal. Now, Congress, the state of New York, and the city of New York all declined to pay for the pedestal, which was estimated to cost about $100,000. So um, it was all raised through private efforts um, and with some difficulty because uh, Americans weren't that excited about this gift from France. Uh, so one of the many fundraising efforts was an art auction. And Emma Lazarus, who was a young New York poet, was asked to contribute a poem. Uh, she said she didn't write to order, which I love. But she did submit a poem. And um, so interestingly, Mark Twain was also asked to submit something, and he declined. He sent a check, but he said he didn't think we needed a statue. Um, so Lazarus was the daughter of a wealthy uh, Jewish family uh, who, in, in the early 1880s, became really interested and passionate about the treatment of Jews in Tsarist Russia. So this is what her poem was about. Um, the poem was printed in a catalog of the art auction. You can see there the flyer from the auction. Um, uh, but it was quickly forgotten when the statue officially, that was 1883. When the statue officially opened in 1886, uh, the poem was not mentioned nor read. Um, and Emma Lazarus died the following year in 1887 at the young age of 38. The poem was rescued by a friend in 1903 who found, it in a, found the uh, catalog of the auction in a bookshop and raised money to have it in bronze, uh, in, engraved in bronze. And it was put on the second story of the pedestal, so nobody noticed it. And it was rescued a second time in 1936 by Louis Ad uh, Adamish, who was a Slovenian-American writer, uh, very well known in his day, uh, who publicized the poem as part of his own uh, passion about cultural pluralism. So Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor becomes a trope that he did a lot to publicize. It's recited in at least two Hollywood movies in the early 1940s during World War I, including a movie by Hitchcock, uh, Saboteur. And in 1945, after the war, the bronze tablet was moved out of the second floor, which actually was inside the pedestal, to the main entrance. 
Okay, so this is really a story about this poem gaining resonance and meaning to people decades after you know, it was written. So since that time, um, the statues become a symbol of an American tradition of welcoming immigrants, um, a symbol of the U United States as an inclusive nation, uh, a nation of immigrants. And here you see how this idea is um, circulated today in our own movement. So um, Anna Mish uh, wrote a book in 1945 called Nation of Nations, um, which is a celebration of ethnic diversity in America. It's a popular book written for general audiences. Uh, and it was part of a trend that came out of the war against fascism, uh, that the democracy that our country fought for was uh, a democracy that was anti-racist and inclusive. In 1951, Oscar Handlin um, of Harvard University um, published a, a very famous book called The Uprooted. Um, and this book, well, Handlin really made American immigration a serious subject of study in history. Right? Before then, nobody uh, wrote about immigrants from a, any historical point of view. And he was the first one to write about immigrants as historical subjects in their own right, right. Up to this time, social scientists wrote about immigrants as problems, right, as objects of study. Hanlon was the first to give them agency as human actors. Um, and, uh, and the uprooted contained a theory of immigration, a new theory of immigration. And the first lines of this book, um, once I thought to write a history of immigrants in America, then I discovered the immigrants were American history. Now, this famous first lines really has a double meaning. The first meaning is the popular one that we all associate with nation of immigrants, right? That the United States uh, is made up of immigrants. And, um, but Hanlon had another meaning, which is really the thesis of his book, which is that the immigrant experience was the American experience of modern society, of becoming a modern society. And what he meant by that was that peasants, because he, he talked about European immigrants, Peasants coming from Europe at the turn of the 20th century were uprooted from their villages, uh, small communities centered on family and their churches. Uh, they go to the United States where they're alienated, working in industrial uh, cities. Um, and, he's, and he says they really have the same experience as native-born Americans who are moving from farms into the cities, from agriculture to factory work. Um, and, uh, and they overcome their alienation and become modern Americans through their associational life and civic engagements. And that's the basis of our democratic society, right? So this was Hanlon's view of assimilation, right? Which is this rupture, this uprooting from a traditional past and alienation being kind of dropped in the middle of a industrial urban society and then figuring out how to become part of it. Right, through associational kind of non-governmental forms. Now, Hanlon himself was very active in immigration reform in the 1950s. Actually, when I was here at the Radcliffe Institute more years ago than I would care to say, I interviewed him. He was still alive then about that time. It was very interesting. So he um, did a lot of work in Washington, um, lobbying for immigration reform. He worked uh, for uh, Senate committees on immigration. And in 1958, this book is published by John F. Kennedy when he was still a senator, A Nation of Immigrants. Now this book was pitched to Kennedy as a project by the, by the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, which was a Jewish organization that was very active in promoting educational uh, books and pamphlets to combat discrimination and prejudice. And Hanlon did a lot of work with them. And Nation of Immigrants was actually drafted by Hanlon's first PhD student here at Harvard, Arthur Mann. Now, the end result that gets published was very different. It w did not have the complexity and nuance that Hanlon and Mann uh, would have liked to see. The end, it was more a celebratory account of the diverse origins uh, and contributions of Americans. Um, what I should just mention, though, is that there are hardly any Asians or Latinos in the book. It's all about, it's all about Europeans. Okay, so. This becomes a theory, right? What Hanlon's thesis becomes uh, ingrained as a theory of immigration. And that theory 
is something I, sh I think you all know, which is that immigrants' social economics mobility to the middle class is a normative path of American experience, right? It's the American dream theory, right? People come, even if they have to struggle against discrimination, even if they're poor, they struggle, they work hard, they study hard, they achieve the American dream, right? That's the path, right? And this is the Hanlon idea put into a general idea that becomes popularized in the post-war period. And here you can see this path from uh, a garment worker, a sweatshop worker taking clothes home from, to her tenement to the uh, suburbs of the 1950s, right, the Levittowns um, of the post-war era. Okay, so let's take a look at this mobility. So it is true that in the post-war period, there was a remarkable upward mobility of the second and third generation of the European immigrants who came at the turn of the century. Um, the percentage of people who are professionals doubles um, among Jews and Italians. I mean, there, there are far more Jews in the professions than Italians, but the, as a percentage, they, they both double. Um, Jewish men move almost entirely out of factory work and more than half of the women leave factories for jobs in offices and shops. Um, among Italians, men move almost entirely out of common labor, that is like ditch digging, you know, road work, um, and into skilled and semi-skilled jobs, uh, and women move also into factories, out of factories and into office and retail. Uh, this bottom picture is from the movie Brooklyn about an Irish immigrant who comes in the 50s, a beautiful book and also a very nice movie, and she's working in a department store. Okay, so let's, um, but one thing I should say, though, is that this mobility in the post-war period is mostly among a late cohort of the second generation, that is, people who were born around 1920, right? So if you were, well, I'll show you this. So if you were a second generation from a European immigrant family that arrived in 18, if you were born in the 1890s, you didn't have this path, right? This is a late cohort. So let's look at this in terms of an ethnic wage ratio. So what's the ethnic wage ratio? It's what percentage the ethnic wage is of the wage of native, white native born, right? So in, can you, this is not a big screen. Can you guys see this? Um, uh, so in 1910, right, orange is immigrant men, Europeans. Men made 55% of native white men, okay? And the second generation made like 62%. Okay, so you can see this gradually go up. So, what's it, so what do we see here? First, we see that the immigrant generation and the second generation actually reach parity to each other, right, after world, around World War II. And then they reach near parity with whites by 1960, right, 90, 93%. Okay, so you see a definite rise, right? But it's also, you know, as I said, if you were born in an earlier cohort of the second generation, you were still only making 60% of what uh, a white person made. Okay, so let's look at that compared to Mexican immigrants in the second generation in the late 20th century. So Mexican immigrant men in 1970 made about what immigrant men from Europe made in 1910. But it goes backwards. Even the second generation in 1980 makes less. And new immigrants in 2000 make even less. Okay, so we don't see the same. I mean, we kind of know this intuitively, right? <laughs> that things are not good for um, Mexican immigrants. Um, but why, why is this? Wh what's the reason? And um, so, so a, lot of, a lot of people will say things like, well, when my ancestors came, they worked really hard and they made it. And immigrants today, they don't work that hard or they don't want to learn English. Well, actually, the people that came from Italy in 1910, they didn't learn English either, right? And they worked just as hard. They just didn't get that far, right? So there's a lot of cultural, kind of easy cultural, and if I may say racist, explanation for why the European immigrants did well or appeared to, or we re remember them as having done so well, 
um, and why uh, Mexicans haven't done so well. So I think, okay, you're not going to be able to, can, can anybody read this? No. Okay, so <laughs> this is what I call the conditions of possibility. So what's the situation in the United States after World War II, and what's the situation in the late 20th century? So in terms of distribution of wealth, in the post-war period, we had declining income inequality, right? From 1947 to 74, we had a decrease in income inequality. That means a growth of a middle class, right? We have the opposite. Since 1974, we have increased income inequality, right? A high end and a low end, and the shrinking middle class. What are the economic trends? After World War II, we had economic expansion, the growth of a public sector, new industries like healthcare, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, industries that needed skilled, professional, technical workers, right? And a lot of that led to um, a boom in, in higher education, right? The California, uh, state of California system, right? Cal State system, the State University of New York, all these big state systems, they explode in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, right? It's the trained people for these industries. So you could get a job, even if you didn't go to community college or college, you could get a job with only a high school education. You could get a job in an, in an aerospace factory, in an auto factory that paid a good union wage, that had benefits. You could buy a house, right? This, these conditions don't exist, right, in the late 20th century, where you have deindustrialization, the rise of a finance sector, service sectors, which pay very low wages, are often not unionized, a shrinking public sector, right? All the avenues that opened up you know, good jobs at good wages for people with not a lot of education, in the post-war period, all of that has disappeared. Um, we have an evisceration of public schooling, especially in big cities, uh, shrinking public welfare, and a very big difference between now and then is that we have now in in the post-war period, immigration was nearly all legal, nearly all legal, whereas since 1970, since post-1965 immigration law, we have now large stream of undocumented alongside of legal immigration. And that's one of the biggest factors in terms of um, the kind of stagnation you see in wages. Okay, so if we talk about nation of immigrants, it it suggests a kind of natural or normative progress that does not take into account actual conditions, right? Political economy and social structures. And it's also, I, th and I think, see where Handlin was so brilliant <laughs> was he, he created this theory in the moment of, its, of reform that took the experience of one generation or one cohort of one generation and read it backwards Right, nation of immigrants read it backwards as a theory of all of American history, right, and then projected it forward as the expectation of all of all immigrants. And I think that's uh, pernicious because it takes just one study, one case, to make it uh, universal. Um, and also read backwards, it's a false history of the United States. It's not the history of the United States. So you know, it elides. Uh, Native American history, conquest, it elides slavery, right? Um, territorial acquisition, right? You have to bracket all those huge aspects of American history to say we are a nation of immigrants, right? So it's a very incomplete um, and pernicious, I think, kind of argument. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, another, a different way to think about our immigration history rather than this myth of nation of immigrants, to think about it as a series of regime, what I call regimes of inclusion and exclusion. Right, so you can see here, so we have, we can say we have two different systems historically, right? One was we had normatively open borders and one of closed borders, right? By, Normative, I mean, their borders are normatively open. They're ge in general open, but there's some exceptions. And by close, I mean the general rule is one of close, and there's some exceptions in terms of who we let in, right? And so these are two really distinct ways that our immigration uh, policy has, has, has 
uh, unfolded over the years. So we had open borders during the era of colonial settlement, and I don't think it's right to call the people who came immigrants. They were settlers, they were colonists, they were conquerors, they were not immigrants, they were colonial settlers. Um, but all the way after the formation of the United States through the 1880s, you had a period of national sell settlement and continental expansion where people actually were not even called immigrants among their peers. They were called emigrants. And they called themselves emigrants, pioneers, because they were still in a nation forming period. And that's how they saw themselves and saw them saw each other. Now there are some exceptions. The Irish are an exception to that. But Generally speaking, this whole period of expansion um, is one of, uh, of uh, settlement. And then you have the mass labor migration of the late 19th and early 20th century, um, which led to, uh, gave rise to a lot of nativism um, and took several decades for them to actually legislate restrictive immigration. Now, Chinese and Asian exclusions happens before this. It's earlier, so these regimes do not completely fall in line. I mean, they, there's exceptions for some and the other. Um, but you get increasingly restrictive regimes um, starting in the 20s, the national origin quotas, and, um, and since 1965, global restriction. So when people say we have the most open system in the world, that's not true. We have a very closed system. It's very picky about who we let in and how many we let in. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more later. But I want to go back and talk a little bit about Chinese and Asian exclusions because this experience lays, well, it means two things, right? It's important for two reasons. First, it's the racist legislation against Chinese and other Asian people, um, excluded people from immigration and from naturalizing as citizens, um, and cast them as permanent foreigners, as unassimilable to America. And these are kind of racial stereotypes that follow us to this day. Uh, but in addition to that, in addition to the harms to Asian people, the laws and practices from the Asian exclusion era set down the foundation of our immigration law, our general immigration law today. It all originates in Chinese exclusion, right? So uh, before Chinese exclusion, well, before the Civil War, immigration was regulated by states, not the federal government. And that's simply because the slave states didn't want any the federal government telling them how they could move their people around, their, their property, right? So it's something that was not resolvable until after the Civil War. And in the 1870s, immigration becomes under federal regulation, and it's seen as something under the Commerce Clause, which is a kind of catch-all constitutional category for federally, feder federal regulation of, of things. And with Chinese exclusion, which is challenged by the Chinese, um, they, the Supreme Court moves immigration from commerce to uh, the so sovereignty, a matter of sovereignty. It becomes a question of national security. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that um, uh, the regulation of immigration is not under the Constitution, it's not governed by the Constitution. It's in the same basket as foreign relations, uh, Congress's powers to declare war or make treaties with foreign nations. Um, so immigrants are understood in the law, and this exists to this day, as actual or potential agents of foreign powers. Now we think of immigrants as people who come mostly for economic reasons, and if they come for political reasons, it's usually because they're fleeing some regime, not carrying the, the politics of that regime, right? But from Chinese exclusion, we have this idea that immigrants, all aliens, are actual or potential agents of foreign powers. And, um, and we have the idea from that that no alien has the presumptive right to enter the United States or remain in the United States. Now, a lot of, my, a lot of people might think the first has a modicum of sense, right, that no random person that's, that's not an American citizen out there has a presumptive right to enter. I mean, one might say maybe they should, right, that we don't believe in borders. But a, a lot of people will think that there's no a priori right that anybody randomly has to, to come into this country and stay. But the second proposition is far more troubling to, to far more people. 
which is that aliens have no right to remain. Once they are here, even if legally admitted, they don't have a presumptive right to remain. Uh, but that is what we have um, in the law. And that's why deportation is so hard to challenge, right? Because the government actually has an absolute right to deport you, to deport people. Uh, and this is called the plenary power, right? Plenary in this instance means absolute, that the Congress and the executive acting to enforce the laws of Congress has absolute authority over immigration not to be challenged by the courts. And this went through decades of test cases, mostly brought by Chinese and some by Japanese immigrants, that laid down this foundation that the regulation of immigration in admission and removal uh, has almost no oversight by the courts, right? And it's not governed by the Constitution. So that's where we get things like, you know, Chinese exclusion is where we invented extreme vetting, um, detention, hearings without legal representation, removal without judicial hearing. Um, you know, some, there were some procedural due process uh, rights that were established in the 70s in removal, but they're very narrow. And even since the 90s now, we have, we have new concepts like mandatory removal or expedited removal. Um, Okay, on the positive side, uh, the Chinese ruling in Wang Kim Art in 1898 upheld birthright citizenship under the 14th Amendment for all persons born on U.S. soil, including all children of all immigrants. So this was not a settled question until 30 years after the 14th Amendment, right? Did it really apply to everyone born on U.S. soil? And the Supreme Court, you know, they had no love for Chinese people. They said, well, if we, if we deny birthright citizenship to chi the children of Chinese immigrants, we will jeopardize the citizenship of all the children of the Europeans, right? This is, this is in the ruling. Um, so what this means is that immigration law, or this idea of sovereignty, national power, and the plenary, pl national security, and the plenary power carves out, carved out two realms of rights, right? Two, one is where the Constitution applies, which is to all persons who are present territorially in the, on U.S. soil. If you're present, it doesn't matter if you're an immigrant, a citizen, you have rights under the Constitution, right? The Bill of Rights speaks of persons, not citizens. The 14th Amendment speaks of pers all persons, not citizens, right? So those apply to everybody. But in matters of admission and removal, aliens have no rights, right? Now, in law, there's a kind of fiction that these are two separate realms. Like once you're in, you have rights, you know. But I think common sense tells us that you can't completely separate these two, right? Because do I really have the right of free speech if you can deport me after, if you don't like what I say, right? It's, it's much dicier than that. And that contradiction played out in World War II with the internment of the Japanese Americans, right? Under the guise of military necessity and national security, the internment of um, 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, half of them citizens. Now this is the famous, um, what does he say? Okay, this is the famous poster. I don't know if you can see, I tried to highlight here. Uh, this is the order for removal. It says, all Japanese persons, both alien and non-alien, isn't that interesting? Non alien, what's a non alien? They won't say, they don't want to say citizen, right? So they have aliens and non aliens as a way to round up the Japanese. Um, and uh, so internment was driven uh, by blatant racism. I mean, in the army orders, you know, the, the language is a Jap is a Jap, a Japanese is an enemy race, et cetera, uh, plus a land grab in, in California. Um, but this rationale of military necessity, which is in the Korematsu ruling, actually has never been overturned, right? Korematsu, the, rule, the conviction of Fred Korematsu, who violated the curfew, um, was uh, vacated, right? But the ruling was never overturned. And the ruling is that if the military says it is necessary to do X, round up 100,000 people, then it is not the job of the court to question 
the military's assertion, right? They're not, they don't have, they don't have a right, the court doesn't have the right to look behind the veil, right? Look behind the paper, right? And this is what is at stake in this Muslim ban, right? This is what's at stake, right? So a lot of legal scholars say Korematsu is a dead letter, don't worry, it's never gonna be, I don't know, I'm, I'm worried about that. Okay, so, um, all right, so after the, after the World War II, though, you have this wave of immigration reform. This is part of what Oscar Handlin was so invested in, why he wrote uh, what he did in his, his activism. Um, and so it's really this global situation that drives immigration reform, plus the activity and the, the activism of the children of the European immigrants themselves who want to get rid of the, or the racist uh, immigration quotas, which they see as an insult, right, as a stain on their people. So during World War II, I don't know probably how many of you watch World War II Mil war movies, right? Most movies have this, it's a genre, they have this, all have this device of the unit with different people from different backgrounds in it, right? So there's the, the Brooklyn Jew, the Italian from Philadelphia, the Midwest farm boy, right, they're all thrown together in the Philippines or in, or in Italy somewhere and they have to get along, right? And it's this really kind of hit you on the head kind of, um, you know, didactic lesson of, of pluralism, right? Of inclusion and pluralism, what we call racial liberalism. Now this movie, which was called, um, what was it called? Uh, Home of the Brave. In the, the original, it was a play, the original play had a Jewish character. In 1949, when the movie's put out, they swapped the Jewish character out for a black character, right? Which is interesting, because in 1949, civil rights is now uh, becoming on the agenda, even though this is a total fiction, because during World War II, the army was still segregated. Um, okay, so then you have a uh, nation of immigrants, is um, promoted by Kennedy. Um, and you also have a repeal of the Asian exclusion laws. And, um, and this is also both something that's driven by foreign policy. Um, just like in the European case, in the European case, what, why was Hollywood so invested? Why, why is the United States so invested in reforming immigration? Part of this is a Cold War story, right? Some of the Amer America's closest allies in the post-war period were important in terms of um, the Cold War against the Soviet Union. So Italy, which had a quota of like 5,800. Greece had a quota of something like 300, right? These are hot spots in post-war Europe, right? So it's an, it's an embarrassment. It's like Jim Crow being an embarrassment to the U.S. government in Africa, right, in the era of decolonization. You have the same thing going on in Europe. And also in Asia, right? Chinese exclusion is repealed in 1943 as a war measure because China is an ally of the United States, right? This is pure propaganda. How do we know this? Well, the quota they gave to Chinese when they repealed the exclusion law was 105 a year, right? So obviously they were not welcoming more Chinese to the United States. Um, and, uh, and Japan becomes very important for Cold War America. Um, because after the Chinese Revolution in 1949, Japan becomes the bastion of American democracy, democratic interests in Asia, right? So Japan has to be quickly rehabilitated, right? From being the enemy to being an ally. So this is another war movie, Go For Broke, which is about a, uh, an officer, a white officer from Texas who learns about patriotism and valor from the Japanese combat unit that he commands. Um, but it must be said also that Asian Americans themselves promoted kind of a Cold War um, and kind of patriotic ideology as a way for themselves. They, they saw a, a way in, right, to challenge the exclusion laws, right, now where democracy and communism become so important in American policy, they, they could stand up and say, well, we fought for the, we fought in the war, so we are, loyal, we are Americans. So this is a lot of campaign that the Japanese American Citizens League undertook uh, in the 1950s. Okay, so I'm gonna just move quickly here. So, um, cause I think Roberto's gonna talk more about this. So in our own time, the, the, what I wanna do here is draw some parallels to the immigrant rights movement today 
and the immigrant rights movement in the post-war period. Okay, um, so uh, in our own time, uh, the movement is based on the struggles of, of workers and young people, um, struggles that have won support from across American society. Um, but the key thing here is that, that the immigrants themselves are the generators of change, right? Um, and this is similar to what happened in the post-war period where there was a broad coalition for immigration reform, but it was led by American Jews, by Italian Americans, by Greek Americans, right, who uh, were at the basis of that. Um, I think similar to the post-war period, in both periods you had a, a kind of an astonishing shift in demographic trends, right, in the post-war period, in the 50s and 60s. Europe, uh, white ethnics, we'll use that as a shorthand, white ethnics become a critical constituency of the Democratic Party in the urban industrial north, right? So they need their votes, they need to speak to their issues. And in a, in a similar way, Latinos now are 17% of the U.S. population and like ethnics in the 1950s are concentrated in key states that are important in terms of the electoral map. So you can just see briefly here from 2004, uh, to 2008 and 2012, the two Obama elections. This, what are the states that flipped, right? Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, Florida, Virginia, right? These are all states where Latinos make up a substantial, if not huge, proportion of, uh, of voters. And, you know, this is, this is the same demographics that the conservatives understand, right? This is why they're so crazy, because they see this trend, right, of, of more people voting. Uh, and in 2016, we didn't lose because of Latinos. You can look at that map, that we didn't lose because of the Latinos. Okay, so, but demography is not destiny. It's all about politics, right? And you could say maybe demography over the long term will get you somewhere, but how we get there is all about politics. And what we see here is uh, the mobilization of the people. And I just want to end by saying that, um, well, I'm not quite ready to end, sorry. But in addition to this mass mobilization, right, which we've all seen, we've all gone to these demonstrations, I assume. Um, but there's also uh, it's amazing things happening in the federal courts where the plenary power is actually being challenged uh, we have to see what happens in the Supreme Court. It's very unclear, but at the circuit, in the circuit courts of appeal, uh, we have seen rulings against the travel ban uh, and, and against the, the threats to punish sanctuary cities that are amazing in their um, challenge to uh, what the federal government has become accustomed to, which is they can do anything they please on matters of immigration. So, you know, this whole idea that sanctuary cities violate the law, that's actually the opposite. Sanctuary, most sanctu sanctuary is a vague term, right? It's kind of a term of art. It means a lot of things to different people. But in a legal sense, it mostly means that jurisdictions will not hold somebody that they, are, that they have arrested. They will not hold them without charging them past a certain time, it's usually 48 hours, right? You can't charge them, you have to let them go. And often ICE wants to come get that person because if, if they've been charged with any number of crimes, it goes into a database and ICE looks at it and they go, oh, we want that guy. There's a warrant for his deportation. We want that guy. We want you to hold it. It's called the detainer policy. So all these jurisdictions that are called sanctuary jurisdictions are saying, no, we are not going to hold anybody past the 48 hours that we are required. After 48 hours, we have to let them go. So they, they decline to cooperate with the detainer policy. And a district court in San Francisco ruled that they, have, they can do that because the Tenth Amendment has, is called the anti-commandeering amendment, says that the federal government cannot force a local jurisdiction to enforce a federal law. Right, this is states' rights in the 21st century, right? States cannot be compelled to enforce federal laws under pain of financial punishment, right? 
Scalia said that's holding a gun to their head, right? So, so the conservative Supreme Court ruled on, on two cases in the in recent period. One was on the Brady Gun Act, right? The, the Brady Gun Control Act had a requirement that states conduct, uh, that were required to do background checks. And the conservative Supreme Court says no, the federal government cannot make states do background checks to enforce a federal law, the Brady Law, right? And then under Obamacare, the Medicaid expansion was contested, right? That's why it became voluntary under the same ruling. So the same principle applies to the detainer policy of ICE. Okay, so then you have the travel ban, right, being contested on First Amendment grounds. That's awesome, right, on grounds of uh, being invidious religious discrimination, right, as well as violating the immigration uh, law. The DACA rescission. Now, that's a hard one legally because it was an administrative, an executive order to begin with. But there's been ch the challenges are based on 14th Amendment, which is, disc you know, obvious discrimination against Latinos. Um, and uh, the Administrative Procedures Act, which is interesting. We'll see how far that goes. And the last thing, which I think, um, I mean, it's very hard to challenge deportations, right, because the, they really do have the law on their side. But uh, in the event that they do what they've threatened to do, which is to conduct expedited, expedited removals in the interior, there will almost certainly be Fourth Amendment uh, challenges. Right, expedited removal is something they now do 100 miles from the border and they can remove you without a hearing, expedite, right, in, uh, it's like in 36 to 48 hours, remove you, right. Now, the farther you get from the border, the longer people have lived in this country, right, and in most places, more than 100 or 200 miles from the border, people have resided there for five, even 10 years, most big cities, it's 10 years, right? So if ICE comes along and says they're going to do expedited removal everywhere, which technically they can, anywhere in the country, how are you going to say, I've been here for five years, for 10 years? And actually, the immigration law says if you've been here for two years, you have to have a hearing. But this, this is going to be really weird, right, if they actually try to do this. So say they come up to you, Donna, and they say, well, you know, we're going to you know, I, I want to, you know, you haven't been here that long, you're out. And you say, well, I've been here for 10 years. They go, well, prove it. So, I mean, in New York, you know, I've been in meetings where um, advocates are telling the undocumented, you have to walk around with rent, your rent receipts, your children's report cards, walk around with documentation that, sh that you can say, I've been here for more than two years. And even that, you know, like there's no published list from ICE saying these are accepted documents, right? I mean, this is all very iffy. So a lot of um, ICE uh, people lower down the chain, ICE and Border Patrol, they don't like this idea, but it's part of, I think, the shock and awe strategy and deportation that they now have. But this is just to say that um, this, uh, if, if it's difficult to challenge deportations, generally speaking, I think this one will definitely face a uh, constitutional uh, challenge. Okay, so I talked about the theory of a nation of immigrants, why it's historically not correct, why it's pernicious. So we should have an alternate theory. I don't know what that piece is there. But so what would a different theory of immigration look like? Well, first I think we'd have to uh, change from an idea of immigration being a unidirectional assimilationist narrative to one that's more transnational, that accounts for more diverse patterns of migration, that we can have both a transnational and a national frame, right? We don't want, I don't think we should give up the national, right? People come here and many people want to stay here. They don't have to stay, but they shouldn't be forced to leave if they don't want to leave, right? So I think we need to have both transnational and national frameworks in our thinking, and they're not contradictory in my view. Second, I think we have to understand that migration is shaped by global disparities and by both global and national labor markets, right? That's why we have the inequalities that we have. So it's not about culture, it's not about race, it's about big structures. Uh, racism, race and racism have always been uh, determining factors in American policy and that's true for immigration. 
Um, it's persistent, and yet it's always changing, right? Now Muslims are the new racial other, right? Before 9-11, Muslims were almost invisible in this country, right? So race and racism, the nature of it, who's the target, and how it's articulated changes over time. And lastly, what I've been saying is what we saw in the post-war period and what we're seeing now. Immigrants themselves are the central force for change. It's really important that immigrants have allies, can't do it alone, um, but immigrants are the ones who make the change. And uh, I'll just end with something that I often say, you know, uh, oftentimes the way the debate gets framed is are immigrants good or bad for us? And I think that's the wrong question because immigrants are part of us, right? They're part of us and they help us, they make and they remake uh, our nation and our world. So thank you. So it's, um, it's an honor to, to follow May Nye. Um, and I, uh, I'm heartened by the turnout here. Uh, I want to draw a, a, a slightly small, smaller circle. Um, and that is, um, I want to frame my remarks around the circumstances of young people, um, around the experiences of Mexicans in this country, um, and uh, and to tell a more contemporary story. Um, so, and mobilize um, some of these ideas around the, the recent announcement to, uh, to end the DACA program. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on September 5th, um, US, Attorney Jeff, US Attorney General Jeff Sessions um, announced the end to the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals program. Five year program um, that uh, while not at all perfect, um, is arguably uh, one of the most important uh, immigrant integration policies of our last, last three decades or so. So framing this story, framing the, the, the story of, of these young people, um, certainly in, in, in May Nye's remarks, um, time plays a very central role in the story. Um, so our politicians like to say that change takes time. And indeed, if we think historically, um, any progressive change in this country has taken years, if not decades, to accomplish. Um, and the policymaking process is incremental, oftentimes baby steps, um, sometimes two step ba steps backwards in order to, to go one step forward. But these ideas don't square with the everyday realities, with the lives of young people and their families who um, struggle to make ends meet, who, um, who work hard to live a life with, with a, a, a little more breathing room, um, kids who, um, who work hard to try to get through school, and, and parents who, who uh, who labor to make ends meet and to uh, navigate um, sometimes difficult situations in order to get, get home every day um, to their families. But over the last several years, over the last few decades, um, our immigration system has been characterized by an inaction uh, of our Congress. So most Americans will agree, albeit to, uh, with, with varying opinions, that our immigration system is broken, um, dysfunctional. Many would argue by design. Uh, but nevertheless, our, our Congress has not been able to, uh, to come together uh, to move forward a, a comp comprehensive system of, of immigration uh, policy in this country. Uh, but meanwhile, um, we've had a de facto policy of massive enforcement. Uh, what UCLA political scientist Gary Segura has called enforcement on steroids, right? And this is, this is not only under the Trump administration, uh, but really largely built um, 
under, under Clinton, um, expanded through Bush, um, and expanded even more greatly under Obama. Under the Obama administration, almost three million people were removed from this country. Um, but meanwhile, um, children and their families um, like, like these um, here have, have no, no choice other than to wait. So in my, book, in my book, Lives in Limbo, I, I argue that illegality is a master status. So, so two things here. So my use of the I word um, is not as a noun, um, but rather to move attention away from people um, onto the structures, the laws, and practices that narrowly circumscribe people's <coughs> everyday worlds. Right? So, um, borrowing from uh, Nicolas de Genova and others, um, illegality uh, narrowly c constrains um, people's lives. So the other is this term master status. So master status is an older sociological concept that refers to a particular trait uh, or a set of experiences that dominate or overwhelm the other. So we typically think of race and gender, for example, as master statuses. So here I'm arguing that illegality is this master status. So for young people and for their, their families, Regardless of Americanization, regardless of acculturation, of unaccented English, of time spent in the United States, no matter uh, what one's initial advantage might be, um, over time it's this master status. So in more simple language, it's a binding constraint. So a lead weight, if you will, that over time eventually drags you down. So to, 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 to put some of this into perspective, um, to look at a kind of statistical portrait um, of those who are living lives of illegality, uh, more than 16 and a half million people in the United States lives in a mixed status family where somebody in the household uh, doesn't have status, right? So estimates range, but but around 11 million people are living in an undocumented residency status. I'll say that the, the long way first, and then shorthand for undocumented immigrants, but, but really living in an undocumented residency status, what I mean by that uh, is drawing attention to the ways in which that these, these statuses are not natural, they're not fixed, right? Um, and whereas, you know, if we, we, we turn on the, the TV, we turn on CNN, Fox News, um, many pundits will often paint this population in broad brushstrokes, but the reality is much more complicated, much more nuanced, and this is a population that's much more diverse. Uh, diverse. The reality is that a very large segment, uh, between about 16 and 20 percent of this population, has been here since childhood. Um, this is, in some very important ways, um, a Mexican story. So certainly there is a great diversity in countries of origin of this undocumented population. Uh, but the fact remains that most Mexican immigrants are undocumented, and most undocumented immigrants are Mexican origin. So today, about 50% of all undocumented immigrants um, come from Mexico. This number is, has, has certainly dropped in the recent uh, decade or so, and, and net migration from Mexico to the United States um, for the last decade has been stable or negative. Right? Nevertheless, no other country makes up a double-digit share of, of the undocumented. Um, and if we look at DACA, 78% uh, of DACA beneficiaries um, are, are of Mexican origin. Um, it's a large number of countries uh, DACA beneficiaries um, hail from, um, but the overwhelming majority is Mexican. This is a really important, really important point today, as a lot of the political rhetoric around immigration, how Donald Trump started his campaign, was really pointing fingers at Mexicans. Right. 
the terms Mexican and illegal have become conflated today. So Mexican, immigrant, illegal, such that if you would do a, a Google search, a quick Google search of Mexican, you would come up with many entries of illegal and vice versa. Right? So I, I want to um, um, think about a, a, a more contemporary sweep of history. Um, uh, in regard to, to Mexican migration to the United States and, and policy around the presence of Mexicans. Mexican migration to the United States makes the longest and largest migration stream in the United States in our history, perhaps in the world, the longest and largest migra labor migration stream. Right? Um, if we look historically, uh, uh, we look at Mexican migration historically, it is primarily a labor migration. The United States has, has depended on, the United States has had an overall reliance on flexible labor um, from Mexico. Right? In the early 1940s, um, we entered into a uh, guest worker program uh, called the Bracero Program. Uh, so from 1942 to 1964, in those, 20, uh, in those 22 years, right, of this guest worker program, it's really where um, this, um, uh, this reliance or this, this real kind of this system of recruiting Mexicans really, really gets amped up. And the high of the Bracero Program Upwards of 500,000 Mexican immigrants uh, were entering the United States le through legal channels every year. The demand was so much that growers started going beyond Bracero program in order to get Mexican workers uh, cheaper and quicker. Right? So program is in place for 22 years. Right? What's ha what happens in the mid, mid to late 1960s is that a program like this and a, a growing civil rights movement is not popular. Right? We can't justify this kind of, 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 of reliance on cheap labor. So the program ends. But it ends at a time that we are overhauling our immigration system. Right? So the 1965 immigration, 19 and national, the immigration and national Nationality Act of 1965, right, did a lot of things, in, including really kind of overhauled our immigration system and placed priorities of, um, in, in, in skilled occupations um, or, or to fulfill labor shortages and, um, and family reunification. But what it also did is it set in place uh, numerical quotas that would impact Western, well, the Western Hemisphere more generally and then Mexicans in particular. And that is that prior to 1965, the United States did not have any quotas to migration from the Western Hemisphere. Right? So we institute a, a, a quota of 120,000. Right? By 1976, Mexicans were part of, of, of national country of origin quotas, right? 20,000. So think about this bottleneck, right? labor migration uh, the, the demand for labor does not slow down till 2007, 2008, right? 500,000 a year to a bottle, bottleneck of about 20, right? But what changes the auspices under which migrants come to the United States, right? In addition, right, um, our last legalization in 1986 Right, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA, commonly known as IRCA, right, as the, the undocumented migration becomes a big problem in the United States, and so our Congress solves this problem problem by legalizing uh, about 2.7 million um, undocumented immigrants in this country. Right. It also begins a massive buildup of the border and investments in the billions of dollars on our southern border. Right? And so between 1986, or between, between the late 1980s, right, and, and about 2005, 2006, in about 20 years, right, the population of undocumented immigrants swells from about one and a half million 
um, to 12.7 million, the height of, really the height of, of undocumented migration to the United States. And so sociologist Doug Massey argues that uh, this massive buildup of the border right, disrupted once regular and circular migration processes, whereby migrants would come to the U.S. for months at a time, uh, would leave their spouses and their children um, in Mexico, for example, and move back and forth. All right? The border is much more, much more porous um, during the 1970s. All right? But following IRCA in the late 1980s, accelerating through the 90s, is that the United States starts investing billions of dollars in our southern border. And this is really important um, and has contemporary relevance to our discussion of the border wall. Right? The, these unintended consequences, we start building longer and taller and thicker fences, uh, putting more agents on the border, right? and investing billions of dollars in surveillance technology. It's not uncommon if you go to our southern border to see drones overhead patrolling the border. Right? So, all of that, this huge, massive, massive buildup on the border made the act of crossing much more difficult, much more costly, and much more dangerous. Right? And, so, and so instead of risking this very treacherous and expensive journey back and forth, right, is that migrants brought their families. Right? Another important piece of information here in 1996, under a kind of overhaul under the Clinton administration of immigration policies, uh, we eliminated what was a provision called 245I, which allowed immigrants to adjust their status inside the United States. In tandem, why right, is that we also started erecting mandatory, mandatory bars to reentry. So for example, if, you, if, you're, if a migrant had been in the United States for 180 days, or less, it was a five-year bar, more than that, um, 10 years, and then permanent bars, right? And the insidious thing about this is that these bars to reentry were triggered upon leaving the United States, right? So we've got a growing population of, of settled migrants um, that, where, that have a, a real disincentive to leave, right? So what we see is that really accelerating in the 1990s, a growing group, right, a growing number of undocumented immigrants um, settled in this country without, without legal status. Right? And, and a s sizable segment of children who grow up in our neighborhoods, who are educated in our schools, right, to real uncertain futures. Right? And speaking of an uncertain futures, thinking about this history, so our Supreme Court rules in 1982 in a case, Plyler versus Doe, right after the town of Tyler, Texas, um, uh, tried to institute um, fees for children of undocumented immigrants uh, attending their, their public school system. Um, the families fought this up, up to the Supreme Court and, and in 82, the court ruled by a, a narrow five to four decision that states could not deny right, the children of undocumented immigrants access to a K through 12 education. Right. Plyler, Plyler is, a, is, a, is a watershed policy. Its significance cannot be underscored enough. But Plyler's reach is limited. Plyler doesn't address education beyond K through 12, and it doesn't address life beyond school. So whereas undocumented children have access to K through 12 education, right, they, they, uh, and the ability to grow up alongside of American-born friends and peers, right, uh, and, and really participate in this very powerful Americanizing institution, right, one with, 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 with many flaws to be sure, right, that this inclusion, right, does not extend so whereas they've got this inclusion in K through 12 schools, right, they, they leave schools to uncertain futures. Right? They can't work legally. 
um, can't drive in most states, they're not eligible for financial aid, right? They can't travel outside of the country and can be deported at any time, right? So our laws treat children and, and adults differently, but don't account for the continuity of children growing up and becoming adults in this, in this society. So as these young people, as undocumented children, make transitions to adolescence and young adulthood, they move from a protected status to an unprotected status, right? From an inclusion to exclusion, right? From a de facto legal to quote unquote illegal in a pejorative. So for these young people, Right? This is that adolescence, the coming of age experiences of these young people are tantamount to a, a waking nightmare. Right? As they, um, whereas most aspects of childhood don't require legality as a form of participation, as a, as a, as a prerequisite to participate, right? legality becomes much more central in adulthood. Right? So in order to experience defining rites of passage in this in this country right then yeah then young people need to to have some form of, of, of legal status uh, citizenship as a result right is that that and we've 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 um, we've heard meet many media accounts many of these stories told on the floors of Congress right and this um, increasingly uh, this narrative has become part of our national discourse and this, uh, these stories of blocked access right? and, and what that means. And, and, and for young people growing up in this country, right, not only to block blocked access, uh, but also coming into an, a, a greater awareness of their identity as undocumented immigrants, particularly in this political moment, an identity that's highly charged, highly stigmatized, and what it means right, to their lives, lives oftentimes of secrecy, right, of, of distrust, of uh, lives that, that, that really entail a severing of really important friendship networks, severing from uh, teachers, counselors, other adults in their lives. Right? I don't want to ask people hold up their hands, but I'm sure that many of us in this audience have held secrets, big secrets, at some point, point in our lives. So what does it mean to, to, to carry a secret? Right? It's often very difficult to maintain a secret, and it often bleeds into other areas of your life. So for young people, right, coming up with excuses to their friends of why, uh, why they're taking the bus, um, in a city like Los Angeles where nobody draw, where nobody, nobody's on public transportation, or um, uh, why the salutatorian in their class uh, is taking a gap year that turned into three years, that turned into five, right? Um, and what we are learning um, increasingly about is this relationship, the connection between undocumented status and strained well-being. Right? Many of these young people describe physical and emotional manifestations of stress. Right? Trouble he tr chronic headaches, toothaches, ulcers, problems get of getting out of bed in the morning, um, sleep issues, um, uh, worry, what many young people will characterize as depression, um, thoughts of suicide, attempted suicide. Uh, ultimately, though, even the most highest, of, of the most high-achieving young people in this country, right, um, even those um, here at Harvard, right, move out of school and available options in school, right, to uncertain futures, right, and oftentimes their lives after school resemble their 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 peers, their family members, uh, their counterparts who. Um, uh, who left the school, school system um, far well, well before them, right? As May powerfully reminded us, while this is a very, very clear and strong structural story, right, and I would be remiss 
right, to, uh, I'd be remiss if I left out the very important aspect of resilience, agency, self-determination. Um, over the last five or so years, um, we have seen a growing social movement, um, perhaps rivaling Black Lives Matter as probably mo the most potent and most impressive, the most important social movement of our time. We've seen young people uh, push college presidents. We've seen them compel the American public. Um, we've seen them engage in acts of civil disobedience to call attention all right, to the dysfunction of our immigration system. So a few words about DACA. So um, enter DACA in, in 2012, five years ago, right? DACA, as I mentioned, um, certainly has had, had its flaws. Its administrative policy that did not provide a pathway to legalization, did not address exclusions from federal financial aid, right? Um, is a program or is a policy that um, covered a very small segment of a broader population. Right? Is that DACA beneficiaries, while they've been able to assist their family members, right, belong to families and communities that don't, don't have, um, that are in dire need of, of relief. In the short term through DACA, and I, I, I mentioned earlier, I think that one of the, certainly given its flaws, still one of the, the most important integrative policies that we've seen over the last three decades. All right, in the short term, DACA beneficiaries have been able to um, increase their earnings, their, uh, they've gotten new jobs, built, they've built credit, um, they have taken giant steps towards the American mainstream. Over these last five years, they've really grown into a status. Right? Um, many of them tell us that they are much less afraid of law enforcement and of being deported. Um, they have a greater sense of belonging. They've improved their outlooks right? um, and have used really this program as a stepping stone to find on ramps, on ramps to GED programs, to workforce development programs, to be able to build, right, to use these as stepping stones to be able to build experience. Right. We want to think about this, this program, and for those who are advocating for a DACA or a DREAM Act, uh, I would be also be remiss if I didn't put a finer point on some of the, uh, the, the notable limitations, right, is that during DACA over the last five years, families have remained vulnerable, right? Um, <coughs> eligibility to this program was limited. In fact, in my, uh, I teach an immigration class here. Last semester, I had two students who missed the DACA cutoff by two weeks. And I think that as we're well aware of, this is a policy that is provide, provided a partial fix and, um, and certainly temporary and revocable. And this is what we're, we're, we're seeing today. So where do we go from here? So as we, as we open up a broader conversation that includes DACA, but also immigration reform, and how to think also beyond policies towards um, building strong communities. What are the important questions? Um, what are the important steps to take? Um, on the legislative front, um, we've seen several proposals for a, a, a DREAM Act or something. Right, on the more uh, liberal side, um, shorter waits, um, eligibility that's much more inclusive, right, and a pathway to legalization. More, uh, more conservative proposals um, advocating for a basic duplication of, of DACA, 
with no pathway to legalization and no um, what lawmakers are now calling no chain migration, and that is no opportunities to sponsor family members. Right, I mentioned the, the six-month wind down. We are, are, um, we are two months in, so, so less than four months and counting. The politics of this are really tough. Right? Over the last two months since this announcement, we've seen disaster after disaster after disaster from South Florida um, uh, to, um, from South Florida to Houston uh, to Las Vegas to New York. Um, uh, the, um, the inability of this Congress or the, the trust that we have of this Congress is very on very shaky grounds. Um, and we, meanwhile, um, on the agenda um, is the budget, is the, the attempts to, to radically rewrite the tax code, right? Um, and how will undocumented young people respond? But to be sure, right? To be, to be sure, central to this conversation, right? It's not going to be based on the goodwill of our Congress or our elected officials, right? But will be the actions. Right, of young people who are most impacted by these policies in this debate. Right, I have no doubt in my mind right, that central, whatever happens, either on a legislative front or through efforts of, of community building, right, that it will be undocumented young people who will be uh, at the center and, and who will be leading this. time for some questions and I have a microphone here um, so if we can pass around the microphone um, and we can ask questions I was going to have uh, response questions but I think because of the time and also because of the really wonderful turnout I think I'll just hand it over to the audience um, and if I have a chance then I can I can ask my own questions so please feel free to um, to raise your hand and I can pass around the mic um, I, I can do this, that's fine, yeah, um, I will do the, the honors, yeah, okay, in the back, sure, and if you could introduce yourself, uh, oops, oh, I'm breaking things, I am so sorry, I'm sorry, and that's recorded, awesome, <laughs> thank you, I think it's, um, it's just for the recording, so you won't hear a, Oh, thank you very much. These are wonderful presentations. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Barber, and um, I have a question for May, uh, which is, thank you for your talk. Um, I wonder why you're so um, invested in contradicting the narrative that this is a country of immigrants, which I think serves us very well with multiple constituencies. And um, whether it's accurate or not, whether it completely uh, captures slavery, clearly doesn't. Um, I, I just wonder politically, uh, you know, I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. To my mind, it's actually a very useful device. And I also, in that connection, wonder why you uh, are invested in saying that settlers are not immigrants. Because actually, all um, people who arrive don't know for sure where they're going to stay. And I bet if you had been able to question the people on the Mayflower, they would have said, oh, we're just going for a short while, and then we'll go back to England. We don't really want to stay in this new place. So, um, yeah, those are my questions. Okay, great. Hi, Jackie. Hi. <laughs> it's nice been so you. long since I've seen you. Thanks for yeah, coming. Yeah, lovely to see you. Um, okay, well, I think a nation of immigrants is, it's really good politics. It worked uh, in the 50s and 60s, and it, it certainly works today. It's very powerful, so I don't deny that. And I don't tell people to shut up if they say it, you know. But I think even as it's good politics, it's really bad history. And I think that's something we have to reckon with if we have the occasion for more complex conversations. And if we want to talk about, um, I mean, I think when immigrants today say we're a nation of immigrants, it's their way of claiming a place of belonging. 
right? So I think it, it's legitimate in that sense. So I wouldn't stop people. I mean, I couldn't anyway. I couldn't stop people from saying it, even if I wanted to. So I, and it, there's a reason why it's, it resonates with people. I think you're right, because it, it's making a claim. Um, but I think once we talk about the history of this country, I think then we have to reckon with some of the uh, meanings in that trope that maybe many people, when they say it, they don't even understand, right? Um, and I think some of the most um, harmful uh, sides of, of this trope are, is, the, is the assimilation narrative that, that is embedded within it, right? It's not just a claim of, of belonging. It's a, it's a theory of assimilation. Why would it be a nation of immigrants if everybody fared badly, right? <laughs> It were only a nation of immigrants because everybody succeeds and achieves the American dream. And, and once you kind of, uh, if once that's on the table, then you have to explain why not everybody achieves the American dream. Why is it that some people succeed and others don't? So that brings us to you know, the whole set of issues that I was trying to talk about. So I think that it's, it's something that um, uh, is really complicated. And I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's a useful political slogan today. I mean, you know, every demonstration I go to, there's millions of variations of this idea and the idea itself, right? You probably couldn't see in the picture. My favorite placard that I saw at the demonstration was, it was written kind of in Spanglish, like, Congress, remember you came on Mayflower, right? <laughs> Which is the nation of immigrants going all the way back, right, to them. So leading to your second question, I think all people who arrive are migrants. But immigrant, immigrant has a, um, a meaning, I think a, a more specific meaning of somebody who uh, comes to join an existing society. So the settlers who came in the 17th century were not coming to join native society, obviously. They're coming to erect some kind of replication of the old society, right? That's where we have New England, New Spain, New France, New Amsterdam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they may not have thought they would be here permanently, but many of them did because they saw themselves as creating the city on a hill, right? They, they saw themselves creating a new and even better version of the old country. And I think if we don't understand that colonial aspect, I think it's a great risk that we conflate Colonial, colonial settlement with immigration. And in fact, during this period, people did not talk of themselves or each other as immigrants. It's not until the late 19th century that the word immigration replaces emigration in political discourse. Because by then, by the mass labor migration of the turn of the 20th century, then you are having people coming into a settled country and society, right, defined from sea to shining sea, shore to whatever, sea to shining shore. So I think um, nowadays a lot, of, um, a lot of people don't talk about, we talk about immigrants colloquially, but a lot of you know, migration scholars talk about migrants, right, or trans migrants, because we recognize more that people go back and forth, they don't always stay, and I don't think anybody should be forced to stay, obviously, but no, nor should they be forced to leave, and I think people now um, I mean, even in the early 20th century, there was a lot of reverse migration. It got written out of the narrative because it didn't support the nation of immigrants theory, right? I mean, half the people who came in the 19, or first two decades of the century, half of them left, went back to Europe. Half. So half of Italians, even 70, 80 percent of some other Eastern European countries, you know, and so it's not that Chinese or Mexicans were unique in their kind of sojourning mentality, right? But it's the immigrants who stayed who wrote the story, right? And then especially after World War II, that story became very important to a kind of post-war racial liberal view of America. So, um, so you know, in, I think in, in most kind of academic writing now, people who work on migration or immigration, they sometimes use the word migrant to be more inclusive. Um, of people who might have more transnational uh, meanings. But I think this is where I think the kind of national and transnational interesting framings that we need to always have in play together. Because certainly, 
uh, I mean, the dreamers, DACA is about immigrants. It's not about people who want to go back and forth anywhere. They want to stay, right? And they, they grew up in this country. They consider themselves part of this society. Um, so that's very much an immigration issue, right? It's not a question of transnational, you know, uh, thinking or practices. So I hope that addresses some of what you said. Thank and you. I think, and I think to go full circle in your, your, your remarks, I think that it's also that narrative is a is a is a narrative that that in some ways clings very tightly to this kind of seductive American dream, mm -hmm. right? And that this kind of political narrative around dreamers, right, has been around these young people who are class presidents, valedictorians, right, right. Um, super humans who, um, uh, who were minorities. Model minorities yeah. who were innocents who were brought right, right. here uh, to the United States, and, and I think that, that many, I think for many young people, these messages that if you work hard enough, that if you dream boldly enough, if you follow the rules, right, that you can have something. I think that as, as I mentioned earlier, for a lot of them, they they wake up to this nightmare that that's not the reality, right? That, that that's not the reality. That's not. It's not the reality of this country, and and, and and moreover, that this this American dream is really for for, for many people, it's, it's it's a farce, seductive, but it's a farce. Other question, thank you. And if someone at the top has a question, I can also repeat it for the microphone. So please don't be shy. presentations. Um, my name is Sarah, and I'm from the Ed School. And I had a question about um, Filer. Um, and this might be, uh, maybe I'm simplifying. Um, maybe I should know the answer to this. But when I was teaching in high school, I know I had students who didn't even know that they were undocumented mm -hmm. until 11th mm -hmm. grade, when they were yeah. getting ready to apply for mm -hmm. colleges. Mm -hmm. And their parents sat them down and kind of explained to them that there might be a problem. But my question about Plyler is, uh, and maybe the DREAM Act does this, is there a legislation that extends the Plyler decision into, for example, instead of K to 12, let's extend it into college. This way these people are now adults and they can go through a process of becoming, you know, the, the paperwork or, you know, becoming a citizen. So is there a discussion of extending Plyler beyond um, K-12 Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the the there there's not there's not a the, there's I think that people are very conservative minded, and I've 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 talked to Peter Ruse who who litigated Plyler. Um, they very intentionally framed it, Plyler very narrowly. Right? Their arguments were for for Plyler and what they um, uh, what they 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 wanted was really kind of narrowly ta tailored. Um, Times have changed dramatically, right? And this is this is early 1980s. So now, right, is now that that as you I think that as you astutely point out is that in this economy, right, is that it takes more than a high school degree, right? And the, our immigration laws it was very different. Adjusting one's status in the early 80s was very different process than it looks like today. The college piece is interesting, that so that federal law does not expressly prohibit undocumented immigrants from attending colleges. So we've seen systems, so, you, so in Georgia, the, the top three uh, university systems exclude undocumented immigrants, and in South Carolina, and there are other colleges, the state of Arizona um, uh, excludes undocumented immigrants from, from consideration of uh, in-state tuition. Um, but the, um, the, uh, what we have in terms of, of policy proposals have been really around, really around some sort of pathway. Um, but I think that also this, this issue of schooling and merit has been tied to these, both the proposals and the discussions, um, so that we're still in this kind of American dream mentality, this kind of um, if you're successful, if you look the right way, um, uh, 
uh, there's a there's a there's a book called there's a book by Mia Chuan called Forever Foreigners Honorary Whites, uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot with respect to dreamers. I think that this, especially as 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 popular as this group has has become, and as kind of as big as this platform and supporting them has become, is that. They are, are a deserving group as long as, so as long as they're in school, as long as they're youthful, as long as they're not too Mexican, as long as they're not committing crimes, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a very, it's a very, um, it's a very fragile kind of narrative on very shaky ground. Um, and so how we think about that, I think that, I think that we really need to move the discussion and I think the coalition to extend beyond education because I think that there are some really dangerous arguments. Can I just add a couple of points to that? Um, I, I agree completely with what Roberto said. Um, Plyler is, is different than anything else out there right now because it's a right, it's a right to K-12 education. And what you have now, the best you have in different states in terms of college is um, in-state tuition for undocumented. So. Um, a number of states have this. A lot of states don't have it. A lot of states, you can go to college, but you have to pay as an international student, which is, you know, can be astronomical. So, um, so, uh, and and the f you and uh, undocumented under it, it all circum and under any circumstances do not qualify for federal financial aid. So for Pell grants, you cannot get. So it's very limited what undocumented students can do, they can go to college, but under certain constraints. But it's not a right, and, um, and uh, only with DACA could they work. So DACA is not just kids going to school, it's also working, and after college working, and be able to commence a career or, or you know, job of some kind. Um, but now all this is kind of, you know, with the rescission, it's, it's done. So, I also agree that there is this narrative with DACA about the deserving and, you know, as opposed to the undeserving, the criminal aliens, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's, it's, really, it's, really, um, it's really difficult because um, uh, it's a really double-edged sword because Do I think the Dreamers did more than any other single group to sway public opinion to support legalization of all undocumented, not just the dreamers, right? Most Americans support legalization. 80% in many polls oppose mass deportation. They support legalization of the undocumented. And it's DACA, it's the dreamers who swayed that opinion in that way. But it also perpetuates, I mean, and what, what made it successful was this narrative of the innocent the innocent achiever, yeah. right? And I think this is something that's divided the DACA movement itself, right? There's a lot of debate and struggle over this question. Um, and so hence, like when they fought for, then they said, well, we're gonna now fight for our parents. Our parents are not the criminals. Our parents are not the others, right? So this is a really, it's a very, I think it's an interesting kind of lesson in politics, right? How you, what sometimes movements feel they need to say to get first base and then how you try to push, keep pushing, pushing the envelope. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Morgan. I'm also in the ed school and um, I think my question, I have two questions. One that draws on Professor Baba's comment and then another that draws on your comment. Um, just a question about DACA. So I know on the slide it mentioned that students can qualify or could have qualified for DACA before the age of 16, correct? What is the stipulation about the age 31? So are they, could they it, say if DACA in some measure is upheld in March, would they be able to have like a uh, temporary social security number or no? So what does the 30, age 31 extension deal with? 31 was the was just put in there when they was the it. upper age limit at the at the time of the DACA announcement on June 15th, uh, 2012. Oh, okay. So, for example, people like Jose Antonio Vargas, who is older than that, was not eligible. Okay. All right. 
And then the second question is, for those of us who either are teachers, have been teachers, or want to work with students, and many of our students who are undocumented, I think uh, a lot of my students at least kind of drew strength from the narrative that this is a country of immigrants and also that the American dream still exists. Like it's very much like a mobilizing and empowering thought for them, but at the same time we do obviously want to, to be speaking in truth to the reality of the situation um, while still allowing there to be the possibility to dream about these you know, future occupations and things like that. So where is a healthy ground for us as educators to speak to our students about the possibility that they can achieve despite the kind of legal limitations to what they want to do? I think that that's the, that's the $64,000 question yeah. for educators. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and this is a question, so, so, so I, give, I, I give various versions of this talk. Um, six times last week in California, um, and educators always have this version of, the, of that question. And so, you know, I think that, that, that you had said, Sarah, right? Sarah, you said earlier that, that many, many that you met didn't know about their status until they were, until something, a driver's license, uh, trying to get a job, applying for college, a field trip, et cetera, et cetera. In many ways, ignorance, or at least kind of subscribing to this kind of this notion that you can be successful, is protective, right? That it it it, it allows. So, what does it mean at, at at eight years old, at nine years old, at twelve years old, to know that there, you're going to hit a dead end, right? And so, to be able to kind of cling to a set of ideas that say, if I work hard enough. Um, that there's some sort of pathway. I've talked to hundreds of students over the years, and I've been really, really surprised by the extent to which that they believe, and many believe, that their merit, that their special talents, that all that they've done is going to mean something at some point. But then how, as educators, how as people in their lives, do you have responsible conversations with them, kind of keeping their spirits up, well, also, I think really helping them, and I think that, you know, I would argue that, that, that many are very aware or hyper aware of the implications of kind of our, this current political moment for their, their future. Um, but, but how do you keep this balance? Because so many young people that I've met have moved through college, as I mentioned earlier, to fall off a really steep cliff, right? Because for, for many of them, right, that the, this this idea, this real, this this seduc seductive notion of my hard work, this American dream, it's been matched over their lives with success, right? So they worked hard, um, they've gotten good grades, and that's gotten them into better middle school programs or gifted and talented kind of programs, and then they're kind of their um, uh, their their talent, their smarts has gotten them into good colleges, and then they, all of these kinds of things, step by step, have really resulted in success. And when it doesn't, it's a real, it's a real steep, steep cliff. Do you think doesn't it make a difference with um, there being a social movement? You yes. know, I mean, once once people, you know, kids started coming out, right? I mean, it's great. I mean, they took this. This uh, this uh, act, political act from the gay movement, and they started coming out. It was tremendously empowering, and I think that I mean I don't think we should ever tell kids they can't succeed. I'm not a I mean I teach college I don't teach K-12, but I, I wouldn't see why we would ever tell kids or discourage them that they can't succeed. But you know to be honest about the obstacles, I think the only way you can counter that is not just try harder. But, yeah. but with a kind of sense of community, right? And, and how change actually can take place. So I think that's what DACA has helped give us is, um, is a social movement. And I think um, success has to be something that is both uh, individually worked for uh, and, and, and have to be responsible to yourself as an individual, but it's also something that we can all, all have to participate in as a community. And I don't know, I mean, I don't teach, you know, I don't teach high school or, or middle school, but I would think that to me that would make, a, I mean, I see that in my college students. I have students at, at Columbia who are DACA students. And the fact that they have a collective, uh, they have a community, 
I think makes a big difference because they struggle so hard and they, they suffer from so many stresses. Um, and this last year or you know, since the, the, this new administration, it's been like this roller coaster, right? Very of stressful. emotional stress. Um, and I don't know, you know, I think the fact that they have each other and they have a community makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I think that this this is this is something that's 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 really different from from five or ten years ago, um, and we've seen waves. I think, especially two thousand nine, two thousand ten, where waves of students started coming out and shedding the stigma and really finding community, coming out not only to, to kind of a general public, but coming out to other other young people in the same situation. Facilitated, I think, in many ways by um, by student service folks on college campuses, by teachers and counselors providing those kinds of really important spaces. But I think that this political moment, right, is that this administration uh, has scared a lot of young people and so I think, that, I think that what educators can do is to really kind of hold a space for them. We don't want to kind of, comp we don't want to force kids to come out because Right now, right, the consequences are really sharp, um, but to provide those kinds of spaces, I think, is really important. Um, high schools and, and middle schools are learning a lot of important lessons from college campuses of the kinds of supports for, for these students. Um, and I think that that's been, that's been really critical. I think we have time just for one last question. Um, right top in the corner. Yeah. And I'm sorry for the folks up there. Um, in, in light of the current kind of advocacy efforts that are being led by undocumented youth, I would love to hear your thoughts about what is the best way that we can support that effort, whether it's through calling reps or is there any other ways that we can be informed, we can be actually taking the next step, because this is a great teaching, but like what's the kind of call to action? The other thing is I would love to hear your thoughts on if you think that the Clean Dream Act would actually be successful in Congress. I think given my knowledge, we have a one month to pass the Clean Dream Act and as you talk, the undocumented youth immigrant movement is sort of divided on its approach and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on what are your um, hopes or skepticisms about the legislations that are being advocated. Um, I'm very skeptical of the administration but also want to have faith and belief that we can get something done and so I'm just kind of wondering your expertise on these advocacy um, urgent situation that we find ourselves in. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so I, as I mentioned, I think the political picture is really tough. Um, the, the timing here is really, I think to have confidence in a Congress, a Republican-controlled Congress that had seven years to pass a health care bill, um, I, I, I lack confidence in. Um, I think that there's a political will and there's an opening, but I, th I, I think the politics are really tough. I think, um, so, so here's the thing, I think that the legislative issue is the biggest thing. It's the, any kind of legalization is the tide that's gonna lift all boats. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, that this, this change, it 30 years, 31 years since the IRCA, the last legalization, 17 years since the DREAM Act was introduced, right? Um, and so how do we also think about, right? So if, so if people have to carry out their everyday lives um, and not be kind of hostage to something that's happening at the 30,000 foot level that many of us feel powerless to kind of intervene in, right? I think that, I think that, you know, really pushing our Congress is important. I think that that acts of civil disobedience have, have been really important. But I think that at, one, at, at some point we also have to, to really think about local strategies, right? So strategies at the, at the state level. So if DACA is rescinded, right, how do, we, how do we think about the push for driver's licenses, right? Only a dozen states offer driver's licenses. Municipal IDs, which I think is really critical. Um, broader access to Higher, higher, uh, higher ed institutions, so in-state tuition, state financial aid, um, pushing, pushing institutions to do more once students are on campus, 
and then thinking about more kind of local ways right, that you can improve the lives of, of young people and their families within a community. And that's, and that's up to teachers, um, counselors, social workers, healthcare professionals, uh, police districts, chambers of commerce. Right? How, how do we empower uh, local actors uh, to really step it up? Um, but I do want to say that this is a series, this is the first part of a series of conversation and that this is our hope to also build a community like the question asked to keep continue and especially in a sort of pressure cooker time moment and that we're hoping that the DACA um, seminar will facilitate that kind of community that is so much needed um, not just here at Harvard but beyond. Um, I do have a short announcement about um, Undaki Allies. If you want to quickly uh, announce another meeting, which might be another opportunity for a community building um, venue. Yeah, um, so we're with the Undaki Allies initiative at uh, the School of Education. And so we're actually hosting um, a big hands on embedded workshop that's going to be on how um, educators can uh, provide support for. And then um, it's going to cover kind of like what we saw here from the professors, but just a brief version of the loss of policies, um, the social emo emotional approaches and best practices when working with undocumented students. And we're also open to going to other campuses or different programs to give the presentation. And I have um, stickers here. Do you have any? Yeah. Can I just yeah. Okay, sure. Safe Communities Act, which would protect, which would actually separate the um, the funds for uh, local law enforcement, local and state law enforcement, from actually working with um, the DHS and, and ICE enforcement, is actually in committee right now, as well as the in-state tuition bill for Massachusetts. Um, in the meantime, we also are actually encouraging people to contact the governor and actually uh, encourage him to tell the Board of Education to extend in-state tuition for DACA students even after it terminates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending and I most especially thank you to our speakers. Today.